So Jack the Fox author is asking, my question for today is about protoflux. In what direction do you want the language to evolve going forward? What future language features are you looking forward to? So there's like a bunch. Um, there's actually, um, um, how do I put it? The, the funny thing about it is like the if I, if I look at the actual you know future of like scripting and resonite it's actually not just protoflux one of the um, um, one of the like you know things about um, the way I kind of view like you know visual scripting is that it's it's a very it has like its drawbacks and has its benefits and one of the drawbacks is like when you write you know really complex, you know, when you write really complex behaviors, it gets a lot harder to manage, where, you know, typical, you know, text-based programming language might be simpler. But one of its benefits is, like, you literally, it's very, you know, hands-on. You literally, you know, drag wires. If I want to, you know, control these lights, I just, you know, pull out things from this, and I drag wires, and it has a very hands-on kind of feeling. It's very spatial. And the way I can imagine the optimal you know way for this to work is to actually be combined with a you know more typical text based like a programming language where if you have like a lot of like heavy logic you know like a lot of kind of complex uh, behaviors um it's um like you know it's, it's much much simpler to kind of like you know ex like code things like that way but then if you want to like, you know, why like wire those complex behaviors into the world, that's where, you know, visual scripting can come in handy. And I think the we'll get the most strength by combining both. And the way I wanted to approach, you know, the typical text-based programming is by integration of WebAssembly, uh, which will uh, uh, essentially allow you to like use lots of different languages, even languages like C and C++ using, you know, um, with, with those you can, you know, bring support for other languages like, you know, Lua, Python, you know, lots of other languages, write a little bit of complex code, and then some of that code might be exposed, you know, as a node, and that node you kind of wire into other things, you do like, you know, maybe little extra operations. Uh, it's almost like, if you're familiar with electronics, it's almost like having like, you know, integrated circuit. And the integrated circuit, you know, it, it, it has a lot of the complex logic, and then could be, you know, written in a typical language, you know, compiled into WebAssembly module. Um, and then, like, you know, the, the integrated circuit is going to have, you know, a bunch of extra things around it that's kind of, you know, wired into inputs and outputs and make it easier to, like, you know, interface with things. Um, so, to me, that's, like, you know, the op most optimal state, like, where we have both and we can combine them in a way where you get the strengths, you know, of each. Um, and weaknesses of neither, essentially. That said, there are definitely things we can do to improve protoflux. The two big things I'm particularly looking forward to are nested nodes. Uh, those will let you, you know, kind of create like essentially package like functions. You'll be able to like define. Um, if I, I kind of want to draw this one in, so um, I'm gonna get up and let's try this. I'm gonna move this over here. Hello. <laughs> you you essentially define you know a node where you have like you know your set of inputs, and this is kind of like you know my kind of thinking for like the kind of interface. So this would be, you know, your inputs. So for example, you can have you know like value inputs. You can have like you know some impulse inputs, and you have some outputs. You know, it could be values as well as you know, as well as um, impulses. And then, like, inside of the node, like, you can do, like, you know, whatever you want. Um, you know, maybe this goes here, maybe this goes here, this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here, and here, and then this goes here. Or maybe, like, you know, I don't know, maybe this goes here, and this goes here. And once you define this, you, you essentially, this becomes its own node that you can then reuse. So you get, like, a node that has, you know, the same interface that you defined over there and this is sort of like you know the internals of that node and then you can have instances of that node that you can use in lots of different places um with this kind of like you know mechanism um you'll be able to you know package a lot of common functionality 
you know, into your own custom nodes and just reuse them in a lot of places without having to copy all of this, you know, multiple times, which is going to help, you know, with performance for Procrophylax because um, the system will not need to, like, you know, compile essentially the same code multiple times, but it also help, uh, you know, with the community because you'll be able to build libraries of, you know, Procrophylax nodes and just kind of distribute those and let people use a lot of your custom nodes. So I think that's going to be particularly, you know, big uh, feature for Protoflex once this kind of lands. It's something that's already um, supported internally by the Protoflex VM, but uh, it's not integrated with Fruxx engine yet. There's other aspect to this as well, uh, because once we have support for custom nodes, we can do lots of cool things where this essentially becomes like a, a function, you know, like a, like an interface. So you can have systems, um, you can have systems like, um, for example, the particle system that I'm actually working on, and say you want to write, you know, a module for the system, uh, the particle system could have kind of bindings that accept, you know, they essentially accept any node that, for example, has like, you know, it has like a uh, three inputs. Say, for example, like you know, position, position, uh, say lifetime. That's like how long the particle has existed, and say direction. And then, like you know, we have output, and the output is a new position. And then inside, you can essentially do whatever math you want. And if your node, if your custom node follows this specific interface, like it has these specific inputs, this specific output, it becomes a thing you can just drop in as a module into the particle system, you know, to drive, you know, the particle's position, for example, or its color, you know, or, or other properties. And you'll be able to, you know, package behaviors and drop them into other known Proflex functions and kind of, you know, have like, have essentially a way to visually, to using the visual scripting, define completely new modules, um, you know, for the particle system. But it, it expands beyond that. You'll be able to do, you know, procedural textures. Like one, one node that you might be able to do is one, you know, with interface where you literally have two inputs, or maybe just one input even. Uh, say like, you know, the UV, does the UV coordinate texture, and then a color. And then like, you know, inside, like you do, you do whatever. And on the output, we have a color. And if it follows this kind of interface, what this essentially does is you get a, if you have a texture, you know, that's like a square. For each pixel, your node gets the UV coordinate and it turns it into a color. So if you have, if you want to make a procedural texture where each pixel can be computed completely independent of all others, all you need to do is define this. Make sure you have like UV input, you have a uh, color output, and this whole thing can become your own custom procedural texture, where you just decide based on the coordinate you're in, you're gonna do whatever you want to compute pixel color, and it's just gonna compute it for you. And with this, it'll, it'll also fit in a way um, that like this can be done in a multi-threaded manner because each pixel is independent. So like the code is actually generating the texture can call this node, you know, in parallel. So uh, this is going to be like more complicated once, you know, like you, you'll be able to do once, um, uh, you know, to do your own custom procedural meshes, for example, uh, where uh, this one's going to be probably a little bit more complicated uh, because you'll have to like, you know, kind of build the geometry, but essentially, the way that one might work is, you know, you get an impulse and then like you do whatever logic you want to do, build a mesh and like you're done. And now you have your, you know, procedural mesh component and you can just use it like any other procedural component. So I think once this kind of goes in, this is going to be a particle powerful mechanism um, that a lot of like systems that are even don't, don't have much to do with Perflux right now, they will strongly benefit from it. Um, so this to me is going to be like, you know, a really big feature of like Protoflux. Um, the other one that I am particularly looking forward to, especially implementing it and playing with it, is the DSP mechanism. And what that will let you do is make sort of workflows with, uh, with the nodes, 
you know, to do stuff like processing audio, processing textures and processing meshes. Um, with those, you, you know, you'll be able to do stuff like build your own, you know, uh, like audio studio or music studio where you can, you know, do one of those like filters, you know, on audio, it can be, you can have signal generators and you could pretty much use Resonite, you know, to produce music or produce sound effects, or you could use it to make, you know, interactive uh, audio visual experience where like there's like a lot of kind of you know real-time processing to audio and you can feed it like you know what's happening in the world and kind of you know change those effects and that on itself will open up a lot of like new kind of you know workflows and options uh, that are not you know available right now or they're kind of like they're a little bit there but you know not quite not enough for people to like really even like realize it um so the dsp that's a big one um same like you know with the texture one, like you'll be able to do procedural textures, which on itself it's also like you know really fun to play with. Um, but also you can now, once we have those, you'll be able to use Resonite as a production tool. You know, even like say like if you're building a game in Unity or Unreal, you could use Resonite as part of your workflow to produce some of the materials for that game. And it gets a lot of the benefits, you know, of having it be like you know a social sandbox platform. Because say you're working, you know, on a on a sound effect or using on working on music or working on procedural texture you can invite people in and you can collaborate in real time that's given you know thanks to the resonance architecture it's just automatic if you have like you know like for your favorite setup you know for like studio for working or something you can just save it into your inventory send it to somebody or just load it lo load it or we can publish it and let other people you know play with your studio setup so the uh, the dsp part is also I think gonna be a big um, sort of like a doorway to like like you know lots of new workflows and lots of new ways to like use Resonite. So I'm really excited, you know, for it part. And also like part of it is like I, ju I just love you know audiovisual stuff. Like you you wire a few nodes, you know, and now you have like some cool visuals coming out of it or some cool audio, you know, and you can mess with it. Just another part um, for the. Um, for the mesh processing, because you could, for example, have uh, there could be like a node where you input a mesh, and on the output you get like a subsurface, like uh, sub like sub subdivided, smoothed out mesh. Or you do like you know maybe it voxelizes and maybe it triangulates, maybe it applies you know boolean filter, or you know maybe there's some perturbation to the surface. And that feature, uh, I think, will combine with yet another feature. Uh, that's on the roadmap, which is uh, like vertex-based mesh editing, because you'd essentially be able to do a thing where, you know, say like you have like a simple mesh, and like this is what you're editing, and then like this mesh, you know, this this live mesh. I'm actually gonna delete this one in the background because uh, they're a bit uh, bad for the contrast. So I'm taking us a little bit like for this question, but this one, this is one I'm particularly excited for. So I want to go a little bit like in depth on this. Okay, this should be better. So you're editing this mesh, and then you have like you know your own node setup that's you know doing whatever processing, and you know it's making like a more complex shape out of it because it's applying a bunch of stuff, and you edit like one of the vertex, and it just runs through the pipeline. Uh, you know, your mesh DSP processing pipeline and compute new output meshed based on this as an input. So, like, you move this vertex and this one, you know, maybe it does, you know, like this kind of thing. You do this kind of, like, modeling. If you're, like, if you're just a blender, this is what you do with the modifiers, where, like, you know, we can have simple base geometry and have, like, you know, subdivision surface and then, like, moving vertices around and it's updating the more complex mesh by processing with modifiers. Um, the mesh DSP combined with the vertex editing will allow for a very similar workflow, but one that I feel is even more f more powerful and flexible, and also will probably be a lot more performant because uh, our you know processing pipeline is very asynchronous. Because one of the things like when, when I like mess with Blender, one of the things that kind of bugs me is like you know if you use modifier that like takes a lot of processing, the whole interface essentially lags. The way stuff is written in Resonite is like 
you will not like as a whole, but only the thing that's updating will maybe take like, you know, say this takes a second to update and I move the vertex, I'll see the result in a second, but I will not lag entirely for a second. So that itself, I think, will, like, you know, combine really well with lots of, you know, upcoming features and all sorts of existing features. And for me, that's, that's, uh, that's just big, you know, big part, it, even just beyond Protoflux, it's how I like to design things. It's a way where each system is very general. It does its, you know, own thing, but also it has like lots of ways to interact with lots of other systems because that way you get all these kind of emergent workflows that, are, that become like, you know, very powerful and you get lots of ways to combine those systems, you know, into like a single pipeline. So. This should kind of cover it. Um, I'm gonna hop back here. I went, I went a little deep, like on this particular question, um, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, that kind of you know shed some idea on like some of the kind of future things and things I want to do. You know, with uh, uh, not with just Protoflex, but with other things. Um, there we go. Sorry, I'm just settling back in. Um, so I, ho I, <laughs> I hope that answers the question like in a good detail. <laughs>